this is what I've been getting most of the time. Not gonna let this one go. Boom! There you go. Look at this baby. Yeah, you're a load. You get that? Yeah. There. Make sure I got a good picture of you. Yeah. All right, let's let you go. Go on. Well, I didn't take him long to get the heck out of there. But I've debarbed the hooks and I cut one leg off of, of each one. So what happens is as soon as I take tension off the rod, you know, as soon as I release tension, because I want to get down there and get to the, the camera, the damn thing takes right off. Let's see if we can catch another one, because believe it or not, that's probably the third of that size that I've had on this lure. It's just that's the first one I was able to keep tension on and get it into the shoreline. Big, fat, healthy bass. Now again, I caught that one on the other side of that structure right there. And that's been pretty much a typical place on this pond for a long time, right around those weed patches. They just sort of sit and wait for the yellums to come a little too close, and they go from yuggum to yummy. By the way, for those people who care, this is my North Carolina rig, because I wanted to toss a little bit bigger lure in this pond. I got a little tired of those little hand-sized so this is a Spin Fisher 5 pin and a St. Croix. It allows me to toss that uh, little bit larger lure a little further out. And um, what I found in this pond right here, literally the bigger the lure, the bigger the fish. Of course, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but these fish here will attack a lure the same size as themselves, you know? So one more cast, I think. Okay, well it kind of runs and it kind of pumps. It runs pretty good actually. The pumping, I'm guessing that the impeller is probably on its way out. Um, I'm going to pull the little rubber hose that goes to that little rubber nozzle down there that kind of blocks off total flow so you can have a telltale versus a, uh, a big hose. Now, a couple of things very interesting about this. First, to you motorcycle people, do you recognize that? It's like a mini McCuney, where it's a slide type carburetor. Instead of having a throttle cable up there, you got this lever that pulls the slide up and down. What's really cool about that is all the things that applies to a McCuney applies. There's a needle jet, there's a needle valve, there's a main jet, and it has an idling jet. It has all the things that you would you would uh, be familiar with. And on the other side, you have a choke, and it's just simply a a flapper that shuts off the end of the carburetor. Does a typical choke thing. Gravity fed, so you don't have to worry about fuel pumps. Very 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 simplistic motor. What I did find out was on these 3.3s, they came under a whole lot of different brand names. Everything from Mercury to the hot suit and when you see the H on the model number that means it was built in Hong Kong so I guess there was this manufacturer of outboards in Hong Kong that sold their 3.3 horsepower single cylinder water cooled outboard motors to a whole variety of different sales channels including 
OMC. What I'm seeing is actually a very, very nice little motor. This would be a great back motor. You can pick it up with one hand. So when you're out testing outboards and things like that, having a motor like this around really can get you home on a bad day. Now, one of the other things I found was there are several different versions of this motor. I'm not going to go through all the part numbers and stuff, but the thing that's important is some of them have a later CDI style ignition, of which this is one, and others have points. And I actually prefer the points system because you can fix that. The CDI is ostensibly more reliable, but if it dies, you're spending on $150 on parts, you know what I'm saying? With a point, you can get in there and fix it with a file. And since this isn't a performance engine, to those people who are not mechanically inclined, probably a CDI, if it works, is the way to go. But if you are mechanically inclined, I think I'd go for the older one. Just me. So, this one has, in my mind, two potential issues. Um, one is the float bowl may or may not be closing off the little needle jet in there. When I tip it up, gas runs right out the carburetor. Of course, turn the valve off, it's a non-issue. And the second thing is, I'm not getting good stream out this. Now either there's a lot of garbage that's blocking that little nozzle down there, or I'm not getting good pump pressure from below. So. Of course, there's a third option. I don't have enough water in the tank. No, there's plenty of water. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull off this rubber hose from the nozzle and then see if I have a decent stream. And if it is, well, then I'll just clean things out and let it run. Let it pump out through that and clear itself. If it doesn't have good stream, I think we're going to go to the next step and put in an impeller. Go find one online and put it in here. One thing I do, and it's always worth having, is when you have a question about pumping, I don't care if it's on your boat, is having one of these thermometers. So that motor was running at about between 96 and 105, depending on where I shot the temperature with this particular device right here. So, and it looks like I have to pull a panel in order to get to that little nozzle. And while I'm talking about stuff, get yourself a 13 16 wrench like this if you do any type of outboard repair or you got one on your boat because this is the quickest and easiest way to get those plugs out. Mercs, Evan Roods, this kind of thing. Working on these, like the old Mercury's, is kind of like the same level of technology as the old chainsaws like the John threads and uh, the metal John threads and Homolites and McCulloch's and the like. I enjoy them. This one's a little more sophisticated because it has that more sophisticated electronic ignition. Yeah. I'm going to have to break that. My guess is, you know, I'm kind of wasting a little time here. My guess is that uh, that impeller is probably toast. Come on. Yeah. All right, let's get it running again. I would say that's not enough. So we're off to do an impeller, I think, on this, this one. That's all it needs. You know, I think we're going to push this project a little further forward. It wasn't pumping very well at all. So I figured the best thing to do was just get in there and figure out how to change the impeller. They're cheap, you know. I think I spent 
10 or 15 dollars for an aftermarket one. Now the interesting thing is during this period of time 70s, 80s until now there's been some rather big changes in the in the outboard business. OMC that used to own Evan Rood and Johnson and had their own product line as well. Really the same people. They they kind of went out and Bombardier bought them out. So and that's the people who um, made themselves famous with well Rotax and they also make railroad cars and they make some airplanes. They're kind of like a Canadian French Canadian industrial complex. So basically cotter pin takes off this. And if you look right in here, they have this shear pin right there. You know, and the water pump should be behind this. But that pen right there goes through a hole in the shaft and is captured by the prop and that's how the power is transmitted from the prop shaft to the prop. It may look like 10 millimeter to me. And there's your impeller. Let's just pull it out. The other thing we need to do is just blow some air up in there and see if we can make sure that it's clear all the way to the top. Yeah, it's worn. I guess it's worn. That is worn. Yep, oh, I got company. That's what came out of that little 9.8 horse Merc. And while you'd think that's not terrible, it just simply wasn't pumping. And part of the reason was they have to flex out and have contact with the wall of the, of the housing. And if they don't, they don't pick up any water. So, the problem with these water pump impellers, it's not how many hours that's been on them. Although, of course, that that plays a difference is how many hours it's been in the in the water pump. And of course what I found wrong with the 110 had nothing to do with the 110. The fuel tank wasn't venting and I spent an awful lot of time tuning and all of a sudden trying to chase the tune as it was going lean on me. Kind of embarrassing for a person who's supposed to understand two strokes. Make sure I got this. So it deflects stuff from getting into the, the bearing. And then these guys go right back on. And then we start the whole game again about trying to get it on into the motor. And then we have to come up with a tank with some gas. black washer in there. Mm-hmm. You don't want to go crazy on this stuff either. Just pop metal.
I'm going to take a look at the oil in the lower unit to see whether or not we've got decent oil in here before I take it out in the lake. If we got a problem with seals, that would be water. It's not. It's oil. And that's a good sign that that's nice dark oil coming out of there. There's no sign of water in it. And we've run it in that tank for a little while. Nice black oil with no sign of water. So that means the seals in that lower unit are just fine. And that's good news. So let's go push some more oil back into it. I use Lucas or something along these lines. It'll work. And the way you do this is uh, you push it until it comes out the top and then you put a screw in the top as fast as you can. Get it coming up the top. And there it sits in all its glory, next to a whole bunch of period machines. All made in America. Well, one might be Canadian. But it's all that same era of die-cast two-strokes. 60s, late 50s, into the early 70s. And of course, that's when I was growing up as a kid, so that's probably why, you know, some of these things are fun to me. It's kind of like a nostalgia thing. I just think these were cool. I liked them then, I like them now. You know, just the way the Mercury's were built, the way they looked at that point in time. They were just cool. Next, and this was a, a company, I think they're pretty much long gone, but they were really a division of Tecumseh. I guess that's a Wisconsin company, I'm not sure. But, um, Again, meant to be a simple fishing motor and basically a very simple two-stroke design yet again. Case reed and then uh, it's air-cooled versus water-cooled so I don't have to worry about impellers and things like that. Hmm. I guess I really don't know what to think about these. I really don't have a lot of experience. Got your gas tank up there so it's gravity fed. Which means I don't have to worry about a fuel pump. I'm not sure what that's all about. Probably had an external fuel tank once. And this probably is some kind of a shutoff valve down here. Fuel filter. Imagine I would start by just making sure the gas tank is empty. And also we'll see if we have spark. And then, uh, If it has spark, decent compression, and then we can get the carburetor to carburetor. This thing should run. It shouldn't be very difficult at all to make it run. A couple of very, very, very big ifs in there. I think the first thing... First thing is, let's see if it has any compression at all. It appears to have compression. I don't know how many pounds of compression, but it appears to have something. So I think the next thing is to pull the spark plug and see if we got any spark. 
course, I'm assuming there's an on-off switch somewhere. Spark plug. You see it on here, it's a nice hot blue spark. So spark is not a problem. Interesting enough, it shuts itself off with a handle. If you go to stop, that's like a kill switch. Go to start or run, you have a spark. So it has spark. It has compression. All of these now is gasoline, and this thing should run. that Mercury 110 that we did on the channel. What a pretty lake. 